to moderate the session, we would also like to welcome Associate Professor Dr. Jamaluddin Aziz from University Kebangsaan Malaysia's Center for Research in Media and Communication. Hi. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, thank you, dear beloved uh, and dedicated MCs for this morning. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 17th Biennial International Conference on Media and Communications First Plenary Talk. Uh, for this session, I will start by introducing Prof. Wilson Moscow, and then I'll pass the mic to him. And after the presentation, Prof. Moscow would accept some questions from the floor. You can ask your questions directly, or you can type in the, in the chat room too. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, um, our distinguished speaker today has a veritable alphabet of accolades and achievements under his belt. Uh, Prof. Mosko is a professor emeritus at Queen's University, Canada, where he held the Canada Research Chair in Communication and Society and was professor of sociology. In 2016, he was appointed distinguished professor, new, cent uh, a new media center, School of Journalism and Community Communication, Fudan University, Shanghai. He did his BA at Georgetown um, and he was a summa cum laude uh, in 1970 and received the PhD in sociology from Howard in 1975. He is an author and editor of 26 books and counting and over 200 articles and book chapters on communication technology and society. Society. So he is, he is the best person to talk about, you know, um, a topic on technology today. His publications have been translated into numerous languages, especially Chinese, and the, poli the political economy of communication appears widely in course curricula in China, where he regularly visits to lecture and do research. Now, I think he knows UKM. I hope he comes, he will come to UKM as well. So he serves on the editorial boards of academic journals in the North America, Europe, Asia, and Latin America, and have held research positions in the US government with the White House Office of Telecommunication Policy, the National Research Council, and the US Congress Office of Technology Assessment, and in Canada with the Ministry of Communication. He has also received several awards, such as the Dallas W. Smith Award for Outstanding Achievement in Communication Research, the Digital Subline, uh, his book, uh, won the 2005 Olsen Award for Outstanding Book in the field of rhetoric and cultural studies. Actually, this was the book that introduced me to him. In 2014, he received a Professional Freedom and Responsibility Award for Outstanding Achievement in Research and Activism, and his book, To the Cloud, was named a 2014 Outstanding Academic Title by Choice Magazine. And he was named a recipient for the 2019 C. Edwin Award, sorry, C. Edwin Baker Award for Outstanding Scholarship in Media, Markets and Democracy by the International Communication Association. I would say, wow, 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 impressive indeed. So, Prof. Moscow, um, what gives you such an amazing energy and enthusiasm? to continue working in academia. Rob Moscow? Yes, thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction. Uh, what I want to just simply check is to make sure that, can you actually see me? No, we can't see your face. Is your camera okay. on? Yeah. Um, can we um, check this to make sure I can get, um, because my camera does not appear to be on, though it has, uh -huh. I've given approval to Zoom to um, make use of it. Uh, I just wonder whether we can quickly get some, I, I mean, I would like to appear on your screen. Yes, yes, of not course. Not just have yes. you hear me. Yeah, um, I, would, I would tell you the technical. Uh, is there anything that on our side that we can do, the technical?
Uh, Prof, while uh, we are waiting for the technical yes. people to work on that, because this moment of silence can be very, <laughs> very, you know, very quiet. But I think we want to utilize the moment that we have with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Why, why waiting for you to appear on the screen itself? So I wonder what gives you that amazing energy and enthusiasm to sort of continue in, in academia. And you know what academia, academia is like now, you know? Yes, well, thank you very much for, for the question, and it's it's a, a pleasure to uh, to be here. I have visited Malaysia to carry out uh, research. In fact, uh, the creation of two Malaysian cities, Cyberjaya and Putrajaya, uh, provided me with inspiration to uh, eventually write uh, a book about smart cities uh, in a digital world. Um, I have. Uh, I, I suppose I've simply been um, someone committed to uh, a strong uh, uh, view that uh, scholarship uh, would be my life. And I've been inspired by many uh, great scholars who have come before me. Uh, so I suppose at some point when you have worked hard enough, it becomes part of your nature. And so, um, for me, it means uh, uh, the inspiration for uh, and my reason for, for living. So um, there are many problems in the world that we need to address. And uh, I think that uh, we need to devote, I, I certainly do need to devote my own time uh, to, uh, to those problems. I, I was thinking one of the awards was actually shared with your partner. Yes. Yeah, what was that about? Oh, well, my, my partner, Professor Catherine McKercher, uh, was a career journalist who became a journalism scholar. And uh, years ago, we uh, shared uh, a major research grant in Canada to examine uh, the impact uh, of new technologies on workers and on labor and on labor unions. So we spent several years working together, uh, producing uh, a couple of books, The Laboring of Communication and Will Knowledge Workers of the World Unite? Uh, so um, this was a, a very important collaboration and uh, the award we received very kindly from um, one of the major journalism and mass communication associations in North America was was very very gratifying. What about your 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 research now? Is is there anything interesting that you are doing at this present moment? Your your research and your public yes yes. Uh, I appreciate again uh, the question. I'm currently involved in uh, first off uh, completing a book with my colleagues at Fudan University in Shanghai. The book is a collection of articles on the impact of global neoliberalism on uh, digital media and um, the ways in which the, the coming together of neoliberalism and new media have uh, impacted many of the problems, the challenges that the world faces today. So we are in the final stages. I've contributed a chapter on the meaning of neoliberalism, as well as a chapter on smart cities. But we have gathered together a collection of authors from across North America for this book. And it amounts to an extension of my interest in the broad field of political economy. There is a second project that I'm, I'm just beginning. Um, I've always felt that um, political economy could never achieve its goals until it built bridges to other disciplines. And uh, my major interest has been to make connections between political economy and cultural studies. And so uh, uh, in 2004, I wrote the book, The Digital Sublime, which addresses the, the um, utopian visions around the use of digital technologies. I've returned to that uh, 
theme, and I'm beginning to do some reading. I have not progressed greatly in this project, but um, one of the things I like to do before uh, launching a book project is to do extensive reading across a variety of fields on the subject. The theme of it is um, imagining utopia. That is looking at visions of positive worlds that uh, we need to think about in order to address the great global problems we face today. So I've gone back historically to look at how people from all over the world have thought about the good society, the ideal society. And um, from there, I hope to call ideas and uh, points of view and uh, images of a better world that uh, can be juxtaposed to what I see as the four major challenges facing uh, the world today. And that includes, as you alluded to earlier, um, the global pandemic, uh, climate change, the ever-present uh, uh, danger of nuclear war, and finally, global social inequality. These are enormous challenges that the world faces. And I think we need to reach into our imaginations to think, drawing on both scholarly research and uh, fiction, novels, poetry, to think about how we might imagine an alternative world where we're better able to control these global problems. I, I think that kind of defines our Anthropocene uh, epochal, you know, uh, because basically that's, that's part of what human beings uh, are doing to the world as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think that some kind of summarizes the whole thing of what we understand the present moment. Um, yes. uh, by, uh, by the way, Prof, I was thinking, uh, did you have your, you know, the camera that you have? Uh, you know, the, the green light is not going on, though. On, it is... on your laptop, on your laptop. No, on my laptop. Uh, I um, think um, what happens is perhaps you need to restart your laptop because that, that happens to me as well. Because after a while, if I switch on the laptop, my Mac, I will have to restart it to have the the camera work again. So we'd like to do that or we'd like to just continue with uh, the presentation uh, without showing your face. So which one would you prefer? Well, I think I would prefer, why don't I try to restart? It wouldn't yes, take that yes. long. Yes. I'll then click on the link you provided and hopefully we can get this going. I have given my uh, computer uh, permission to yeah. uh, for Zoom to use my camera, but uh, yeah. This is the first time, frankly, this has ever uh, happened, yeah. and uh, I don't quite uh, quite know why uh, that may be uh, the issue. Yes, I just checked again, yeah. and it shows that I've given Zoom uh, mm -hmm. permission to use my camera. So yeah. why don't I uh, restart, and then uh, perhaps I can begin my talk with or without the image. Yeah, I mean, I mean, give it a try and then come back and then we will see how it goes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, we will we'll wait for you patiently. We know it's, okay. it's far away. Thank okay. you very much. You're welcome. Uh, um, has Prof. Uh, Winston. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to apologize for the technical difficulty. Um, the issue is because uh, Prof. Winston wants it to be live telecast from where he is in Canada and because of the time difference as well. He is about 8 p.m. in Canada. And um, and I think another reason is, is because he's, um, you know, um, he wants the communication to be two ways communication during his presentation and indeed he doesn't prepare any slide because he prefers to to have that kind of communication i think when you have great scholar like him he, he has that kind of style and confidence uh you know to deliver his speech so i hope if you have any question please do do leave your questions uh in the chat box and um or in the meantime you can start googling on him if you like so that you you get a, a rough idea of what he can do or what he has done in his career. 
And uh, to be honest with you, the introduction that I've given just now would not give justice to the actual work that he has done. I think uh, I, have, I had to skip that because I didn't want to waste time uh, on me. It should be on him. Uh, but because uh, we need to fill in this moment, I think what I can do while waiting for, for, for Prof. Winston Moscow, perhaps I would like to invite Prof. Dr. Emma to just say hi to everybody as the chair of the conference and the chair of our center. Dr. Emma. Hi. Assalamualaikum. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jem, for putting me on the spot here. <laughs> but I think what we can do is have both of us on the technical, can probably have both of us instead of just highlighting me. Um, uh, uh, maybe what we can do, I mean, this is the, the normal of, uh, you know, um, uh, in the, the boon and the bane of uh, technology in, in, in our new way of working. And uh, we just have to be very agile and very adaptable. Uh, to to any disruptions that we may face, and uh, I think this is one of the things that we anticipate when we do uh, you know in, um, online conferences. Uh, but we are um, you know trying to embrace it and um, always be ready to be called on stage, <laughs> even when you it's not your turn. Um, but yeah, uh, Dr. Jam, did you had a good um, you know parallel session? Uh, did you did you had a good presentation yesterday? Well, if you ask me that question, my presentation has always been very good. You know, it's a trustworthy, a trustworthy of academic if it's not good. But to be honest, I think I was I was happy. I was happy. You know, but other presenters were also good. And and uh, but I wish I wish we we had uh, more time to present. I think. Yeah. Um, uh, by the way, somebody commented on your look, Dr. Emma. Uh, <laughs> Thank uh, you very much. What, what, what do you call that look, Dr. Emma? Dr. Emma look uh, standing on white. What kind of look is that, Dr. Emma? Uh, it is uh, my normal look. <laughs> Anything that goes with the pink background. Yesterday I wore black, uh, I mean wore dark, and today I'm trying with a lighter color. It Look, uh, looks good, as long as it looks good with the background, I'm, I'm good to go. Okay, so. uh, but Dr. Chen, we were talking about yesterday's session, and I, I was actually um, sharing uh, one of the parallel sessions, health communication, under the health communication theme. Yeah. And I was really, and like, I really enjoyed all the presentations and listening to all the presenters, uh, you know, sharing what they have found. And, um, you know, we had a wonderful, uh, you know, um, Q&A session as well. And even in the afternoon, um, I saw, you know, some of the breakout rooms are still on until six o'clock. Yeah. And, you know, participants are still in it and really engaging in, you know, uh, the academic discussions. So I was really, uh, you know, happy to see that, happy to, uh, I feel that that is an indicator that our participants are enjoying, um, you know, what uh, we have uh, prepared for the conference. I'm pretty excited um, because uh, we have actually worked uh, quite quite hard to, to, to give, uh, you know, um, a different kind of experience. Uh, in this conference, um, getting everybody to present earlier so they get mm. to play, they can let their hair down and really sit down and and uh, you know sit back and relax and listen and really absorb you know all our keynote speakers and during their plenary sessions late, later on, um, as well as enjoying you know what we um, have uh, set up for our workshops and continue yeah. from day one. Yeah. I, I think it uh, looks like my I uh, my camera's on now. Thank you. Okay. Oh hi, uh, hi, hi, hi. Yes, thank you. Can see you. Oh, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Yes. Thank um, you. I this problem. feels more personal. Jem, you're a genius for for thinking about <laughs> telling me to restart my computer because that worked perfectly. Okay, please record that. That must be on record. <laughs> Professor Moto said that the jam was a genius. No, thank <laughs> from, you so uh, much. From, I, think, um, uh, I think we have spoken about your research as well, but I think without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, as I, you know, the old wise man or woman in the yesteryear would once say, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So I, with great honor, I would like to invite Prof. Moscow to begin his keynote address and Prof, the Zoom platform is yours. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, for your kind invitation to speak uh, at, at your conference. It's much appreciated. What I would like to do um, today is share uh, very briefly uh, my thoughts about five um, themes. Uh, the first is, uh, and you were very wise about this, to refer to the new norm or what we in the West call the new normal. I'll say something about that. I also want to share with you certain basic uh, ideas about political economy, uh, the field I have worked in for close to 50 years. Uh, then I'd like certainly to talk about uh, some of the key problems in the digital world that a political economy approach uh, has us address. Fourthly, I want to look at, as I mentioned earlier, there is a need to build bridges from one discipline to another. And I wanna talk about building bridges from political economy to more culturally oriented study, that is to look at ideas like mythology and ideology that are central to understanding the digital world. So what is the relationship between political economy and cultural studies? And then finally, the fifth theme is, can we begin to think about alternatives to the way we have organized our digital world? So let's go to the first. Again, very wise uh, of your conference organizers to offer us the theme of, of the new norm. Let me say just a couple of things uh, about that concept right at the start. Um, I feel um, that uh, I've spent most of my life trying to deal with new norms of all sorts. Uh, I grew up in the 1950s when the prospect of global nuclear war became the new norm that we needed to make adjustments to. So there have been, in essence, a series of new norms from uh, the end of the Second World War uh, to, to the present. The global pandemic, of course, is the latest. Now, it's also the case that uh, we are very often asked to uh, make a, adjustments or conform to a new norm. Now, uh, it seems to me that whether we call it the new norm or the new normal, uh, that requires us to define the meaning of uh, normal. That is, uh, is it wise to adjust to, conform to a new norm that is not good for society? Perhaps at times we need to challenge the whole concept of what is normal and uh, raise alternatives to the dominant ways of thinking about making our necessary adjustments. Um, and then finally, I wanna say that it's uh, very important to um, think about how we can um, understand the, the new normal in the context of the history of uh, normal ways of, of adjusting to uh, global crises. As I've mentioned earlier, um, there are four major crises, it seems to me, that the world faces today that may make up uh, today's or some future new normal. These include the global pandemic, of course, but as well climate change, the ever present reality of uh, nuclear confrontation and global nuclear war, and the deepening prob problem, though we have made progress, certainly uh, Asia has made significant progress in addressing uh, the problem of global social inequality. So my suggestion is that we be careful about how we think about, define, and react to the concept of uh, the new norm or the new normal. On to my second theme. I think it's quite, it would be useful for me to share with you some basic ideas about how to, to think about the approach that generally um, 
governs the research that uh, I and, and my colleagues uh, carry out in the name of political economy. I took up the study of political economy in part because it gave me the broadest purchase on understanding the world. And it seems to me it does so through two uh, key definitions that uh, have helped to shape uh, the research that political economists carry out. There is first off a narrow definition. Political economy is the study of the social relations, particularly the power relations that mutually constitute the production, the distribution, and the exchange of resources. In our field, the resource is communication. The key to that definition is the question of power. Who has it? How do they make use of it? And what is its impact on society? The second definition is a broader one, and it's one that drew me uh, into political economy as a field of study. That definition looks at political economy as the study of control and survival in social life. Control refers to the political in political economy. How do we manage large populations? Survival refers to the economic. How does society go about producing what it needs to reproduce itself? The very definition of human survival. So these definitions highlight the question of power and the intimate relationship of the political and the economic. Now, I would also like to share with you four key characteristics of a political economy approach that again have helped shape uh, my research program over the past five decades. Political economists distinguish themselves by first uh, studying the social totality, that is the, the social whole, rather than focusing on one institution or one discipline, political economy looks at the relationships first between the political and the economic, and then more broadly, how the political economic relates to the social and the cultural worlds. The social totality refers to research that takes on um, those um, goals. In addition, political economy starts by examining the historical context of research. So whereas many disciplines, including economics, for example, uh, tend to take snapshots of the world as it is, political economists begin with history. In fact, political economy was invented from um, in the wake of the great historical transformation that led to the, the that, that constituted the shift from an agricultural society to an industrial society. And now political economists examine the, his, the historical transformation from an industrial society to an information society. So we look at the social totality, we look at history, we take seriously, thirdly, moral philosophy. That is, political economists are not just um, interested in examining the material reality of a social world, but also the values that uh, people embody, uh, concepts of what is good and right. That is, political economists bring to the study of communication a deep concern for morality. What is right? What is good? Without any specific moral codes in mind, we take that seriously. We take moral philosophy seriously in our study. So what are the moral forces driving a society today? And in addition, what values should we aspire to in the research we're carrying out and in the recommendations we make for those who make policy in society? So we've got the social totality, we have history, we have moral philosophy, and the fourth and final characteristics, characteristic, and then I'll leave this kind of theoretical segment of my talk, 
uh, is a, a commitment to what the uh, classical Greek society called praxis. That is a term that has been adopted in, in the West as referring to the unity of thought and actions. It's the case that political economists are not just interested in studying the world, we are committed to changing it, hopefully for the better. So um, whether uh, it is Adam Smith who helped found the field of political economy, looking to maximize the freedom of the individual, or Karl Marx who helped develop political economy by looking at uh, what uh, would be the ideal social uh, construct in the world. We political economists are engaged in the world. So in addition to writing my books uh, and my articles and giving talks, I've also been an activist trying to help governments, labor unions, social movement organizations, as well as businesses help to uh, develop a better world. Now I'd like to go to the, the third major theme. So we started out with a new norm. We looked at some concepts around political economy. Now I'd like to look at some of the issues in the digital media world that political economists have been focusing on. The digital media world is extraordinary in so many different ways. For me, who has, who has lived through many different stages of communication uh, development, I'm so old, I can tell you that I wrote my doctoral dissertation at the very beginning of cable television. And that was what, four, over four, close to five decades ago. Um, but one of the most striking things about uh, what I observe in the digital world is that we've gone through a stage where in the very beginning uh, in the 1950s and 60s, one of the dominant themes was the fear of American media imperialism as a result of US control of uh, journalism, broadcasting, radio, television, and uh, other new technologies like cable TV. But then in the 1980s and 90s, that theme dropped back from uh, much of the uh, of scholarly examination in part because nations were developing their own media systems using their own values. Uh, Europe was becoming a dominant force. Uh, my own nation of, of Canada was developing its own uh, telecommunication uh, uh, businesses. And um, so there was a sense that we might see a, a plurality of world uh, media in the digital world. Well, that changed at the turn of this century. And in fact, what we political economists have observed is a renewal of what we might call American media imperialism, largely because of five dominant corporations. There are some others. Um, when we think about the digital media world, whether it is the original internet or what I have called in a recent book, the next internet, it is Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft who have come to dominate the global digital world. So we turn to Google for search. Uh, we turn to Apple for phones. We turn to Facebook when we want to get active in social media or related Instagram and, and other companies that Facebook owns. Amazon, when we want products uh, purchased online and shipped anywhere. Uh, and finally, Microsoft, when we do our, our word processing, our spreadsheets, these companies, it's important to understand, are now the five richest companies in the history of the world. They uh, have broken all records for um, their value and they are pervasive throughout, throughout the world. In essence, we have concentrated media power returning under American uh, domination. And 
while there are exceptions to this rule, no doubt, uh, and there are some challenges, the only major challenger I would argue comes from China, where uh, Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent, and Huawei provide some degree of challenge, but these are by and large national companies that have not ventured far, certainly not into the West. What gives the American companies, the Google, Apple, um, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, their power as well is that they are closely tied to the American military and its intelligence establishment. Uh, these companies have worked very closely with the US Department of Defense, with the National Security Agency, with the CIA, to establish uh, a global surveillance system, making use of cloud computing data centers that produce and distribute information worldwide to produce what some have uh, called, and I recommend, uh, Shoshana Zuboff's book by this title, uh, what some are calling surveillance capitalism, giving power to a few concentrated digital media firms closely tied to the American military, building on surveillance capitalism, that is um, building wealth from the use of the digital world, de delivering uh, the online world to advertisers, the main source of wealth for those companies, and building what some are called the surveillance state. Now, these are serious concerns that it is important for us to pay close attention to, particularly if we want a more democratic world. Now, I said that there are challenges that come from uh, China, and there are some from other nations. But these so far have not been substantial enough to topple the dominant five American companies and their associated companies like IBM, like Cisco, uh, and the occasional European firm like Siemens. So one of the great challenges for those of us who are interested in promoting a digital citizenship, promoting democracy, is how can we better regulate, monitor, and control these dominant uh, American digital media giants? Now, as well, political economists have turned to the study of uh, the digital, uh, digital media and the environment. And I wanna say a word or two about this, in part because digital media companies, again, like Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft have made claims that they will be good for the environment. And in some respects, they have been. But what has gotten lost in a lot of the publicity around these allegedly green technologies, digital technologies, are the consequences for the environment. The internet as it has uh, developed in recent years, mainly resulting from the convergence of cloud computing, large data centers, big data analytics, the, the need to uh, develop algorithms to uh, make basic decisions, and the internet of things, which involves putting sensors in everyday objects from drones to cars, that is the development of a kind of ubiquitous or everywhere computing, where it's not just your laptop that has computing power, uh, computing power is everywhere. One of the consequences of this is that uh, these technologies make great demands for power. They are run by electricity and they consume enormous amounts of power adding to uh, the, the threat of, of climate change. They also make great demands on uh, other resources like water. Cloud computing centers are one of the most significant developments in the recent history of the world. That is because these data centers are located now all over the world and they are enormous, some containing upwards of 100,000 computer servers 
to operate in one large building. But these servers, like computer systems generally, need to be kept cool. The danger is overheating, thereby creating problems in our 24 seven world. As a result, they make huge demands on the world's water supply, already a challenge in the age of climate change and limited resources. And finally, these technologies produce enormous, what we call electronic or e-waste, which more often than not, when new generations of computer systems are developed, these are shipped to other parts of the world and create mountains of dangerous chemicals which have gone into uh, computer systems and threaten water supplies and the environment more generally. So political economists have turned not just to the study of the big corporations that dominate um, the global digital world, but also to the environmental consequences. Finally, they, they look at the consequences for individuals. There is great fear that as political economists are studying that we are developing what they call a quantified or commodified self. That is, as more and more of these uh, intelligent devices are attached to us, whether through headphones or even in the case of some workplaces embedded under people's skin, um, this is creating challenges for what it means to be human and what it means to be something more than a data point, more than a commodity. Now, one of the questions that people ask is, why are we not doing more about this? And there are many reasons for this, and I don't have the time to go into all of them. But my fourth theme says, if we wanna really understand why it has been difficult to deal with many of the challenges of the digital world, it's because digital technology like earlier ones dating back to the telegraph or the telephone, as I described in my book, The Digital Sublime, have been embedded in a mythology that promotes these technologies as inherently good. So my 2004 book, The Digital Sublime, said that people were so exuberant about the rise of the internet because in part they believed in a kind of mythology, a mythology about the end of history, the pre-internet age and the current age, which bears allegedly no resemblance to the past, the end of geography, the promise that with the computer, nationalism would disappear and we can be anywhere at any time. And finally, the end of politics the belief that the rough and tumble of the political world that can be so difficult for us to deal with intelligently would disappear as the computer takes over the administration of governance. Those ideologies grip the early internet and to a degree they continue, though events in the world have dissipated uh, their significance some. But as I've maintained in a more recent book, Becoming Digital is its title, the, the, what I call the next internet, the internet, unlike the old one that was largely limited to your uh, connection through your laptop or your PC, um, the, the next internet brings us cloud data centers, it brings us the internet of things, it brings us big data al uh, 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 analytics with its algorithms. This internet has its own series of mythologies that promoters of these technologies have developed. One I would say is, is the, the myth of the singularity, the belief that the next stage in human evolution is the stage where humans become unified with machines to produce a new leap in human intelligence, in human spirit, and may in fact, in the, more, in the thinking of some, bring about immortality. 
this is a kind of mythology, a story that helps us to feel better about what we are experiencing. There is also a belief, and, and we see this increasingly in work on robotics and artificial intelligence, that we are creating new life. That is what distinguishes the current digital world. There is a sense that with our sensors and processes embedded everywhere, uh, things can come alive. And there is this spirit that is inherent in much of the digital world today. I see this, and in my most recent book, The Smart City in a Digital World, I look at the mythology around the smart city, the belief that humans and technology are coming together to bring about an efficient, effective, effectively run, an almost utopian city, a digital city, a smart city. Now, I think I'm going to conclude with my, my final point, and then I'll take some questions. We need to cut through these mythologies. It's difficult because the stories are very powerful. We want to believe that history is ending, that geography is ending, that politics is changing in positive ways, that we are uniting with our technologies, that we are bringing things to life, that we can create utopian spaces. We need to understand those myths in order to challenge them and begin to think about alternatives. And while I can't go into great detail, I'll be wrapping up at this point. I think it's very useful for us to, to begin in our, in our examination of policy and to join others who are doing so as well, to think about the digital world broadly as a public utility as an institution that treats information in some ways, like we treat water, like we treat uh, electrical power, as utilities that are rights of citizenship that belong to everyone. Information should not be a commodity. It should be a human right. And one of the ways to see that it is, is to build public utilities around information at the local, national, and international level that guarantee access and that ensure a degree of democratic control so that we are more than commodified beings, more than data points in the world, that we are genuinely citizens of this new digital world. And I thank you for uh, your patience and listening to me. Sorry about the earlier technical glitch. And I'm happy to take some questions at this point. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, it was worth it. It was worth the wait. And don't you worry, we filled the time with, you know, understanding what is happening in the conference itself. Uh, so I think we should not uh, waste any more time. I would like to open the floor to questions. What you can do is either you write, uh, your question in the chat box or you press the reaction, raise your hand and I will go to you. Um, so uh, let me check Prof, if there's any question for you, but I think there was one question when I was asking you about your recent research. Somebody was asking about how you define neoliberalism in your work. Yes, uh, that, that's a good, uh, good question. Uh, neoliberalism is a form of governance that shifts power from citizens and governments uh, to businesses through um, uh, policies like deregulation, privatization, uh, transferring power from the public world to the private world, enabling private corporations to do a lot of the work that public institutions once carried out. So for example, one of the, the, the five major companies I talked about earlier, companies like Facebook and, and Google are now major educators in uh, certainly Western countries taking over the role of uh, public education in many respects. And that in itself is a form of neoliberalism, shifting power from the public to the private sphere. 
Um, that, I, I, I was thinking of the same line of question, actually, before I waiting for others to ask. Uh, I have that privilege to ask you that question first. I was thinking um, in terms of communication in uh, the, the global East, you know, global South, in, in, so to speak, yes. because there is a movement of decolonizing uh, mm -hmm. communication scholarship, for example, and uh, by listening to what you have said about, uh, you know, political economy of communication itself. So do you have any opinion in terms of how we from the global South, so to speak, uh, start to decolonize uh, communication scholarship in our, you know, area? Yes. It's very important for us uh, wherever we are located. And as a Canadian, I have felt the brunt of American power uh, in controlling a good deal of Canadian media. And what we have learned to do is very proudly develop our own cultural forms, our own networks, our own digital systems that we can use to challenge uh, what is genuinely the hegemony or the common sense taken for granted view that the US uh, in particular, but Europe as well, knows best when it comes to communication and culture. So what I challenge students to do is to develop their own individual identities and to press forward their own visions of culture. Now this can be difficult because we face great resistance uh, to this development. But in my work, whether in, in Latin America, where I've worked in Brazil, or even in China, where the situation is far more complex than the media would present it to be, I have encouraged people to develop their own cultural forms and to join those movements worldwide. And it's very important that you pointed this out. There are global movements to bring about social change and resistance. And uh, I've been happy to be a part of some of these over the years, and I strongly encourage people uh, to do that. I, I was thinking as well, because uh, we live in a so media saturated environment. Yes. In, the, in this case, it's, it's easy to say, you just have to distinguish yourself and, and whatnot. But what about the, the, the false consciousness that's been surrounding us? How do we do, you know, look beyond that false consciousness that 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 being around us to actually see who we are and not or not and not media constructed of who we are actually. Yes, it, it is it is difficult and it is a challenge, but it is certainly far from impossible. We are saturated by media, but uh, what we uh, are also have are up uh, uh, is a recognition of who we are as individuals. And who and, and what kind of world we want to be. I mean, just look, for example, at the re resistance that young people have put forward around climate change. Mm. Uh, there is a global movement of young people that have challenged fundamentally the dominance of big corporations and their ideology of, you know, don't worry, it won't be a serious problem. We have it under control. But People are not, uh, are not acknowledging that. They're recognizing the need to intervene in the world. It is very difficult. Um, you know, you, you asked how I, I got into this business uh, in, in uh, your earlier uh, question. And I think a piece of it was um, the recognition that coming from the working class myself, that the images that came out of the media did not reflect the world I knew and that I experienced. So given that much of the world lives in poverty, it must be clear to many people that the world portrayed in the media is not the world in which they live. And that in itself sets up an early contradiction. It certainly did in me and led me to develop a critical approach to understanding the world, a refusal to accept that which was uh, given to me. And frankly, it can be very difficult. I, I certainly don't uh, deny. It's not just a media saturated world. It's, it's a power saturated world that tries to get us to conform to authoritarianism uh, and to the power of, uh, 
of those in institutions uh, that appears to be beyond our control. Uh, Prof, I think this relates very well to the question posted by one of my colleagues, Prof, uh, Dr. Norma. She asked the question of, uh, you know, can you elaborate more on information? Should information, sorry, the question was, information should not be a commodity that was a statement. So it should be a human right. So how yes. do you respond to that statement? I think it echoes what you have said earlier, but, you know, looking at that question from that perspective, how, how do you frame that? First off, as a political economist, as I argued earlier, we, we start with history. And uh, when we look at this historically, information has been a public resource for most of the history of humanity. It is only with the development of capitalism that information got to be, over, over the years, narrowly construed as primarily a vehicle to increase wealth. Uh, and that has only been with us for the last 300, 350 years. Um, information generally is a public resource. Now, of course, we're facing the power of large corporations who want us to see it as a commodity, but uh, we must recognize that uh, there is greater value in information when it is a public resource. In order, for example, to be a citizen in a society, something I think we all should strive to be, we need to inform ourselves with a, a wide variety of sources of information and not just those that are filtered through um, companies that want it to be a commodity. So uh, whether it's public libraries, public education, the public postal service, these have all been institutions that have tried to see information as a human right and a, a public resource. Uh, it has only been in, in recent years that companies have tried, whether by defunding public libraries, creating private education, uh, eliminating uh, public postal services and focusing on private telecommunications providers. It's only been in recent years that more commodified forms of information have taken hold. I think it's central for us, as challenging as it may be, to resist the commodification of information. Why? Because when we do so, we produce better citizens and better nations. And so part of my research is to highlight the examples of people and their social movements that have sought to bring back uh, a focus on information as a public uh, resource. Uh, Prof, I would like to ask one question from, I would like to pick up one question from your audience. I was thinking, um, the question was, um, do you think some countries in this civilization are still having demagogue uh, leaders and masking it in the free name of democracy. Did, did you understand the question? Uh, th there was some something ringing. to do with the myth. I thought it's something to do yeah, with the I, myth as well. Can you just repeat that one more time, please? I, I right, didn't okay. get all of it. All right. Uh, let me read the whole thing because it sure. gives a background. When I heard about your insight uh, on neoliberalism, I immediately thought of demagoguery and ideology yes. Socrates was afraid of. So do you think some countries in this civilization are still having demagogue uh, leaders and masking it in the free name of democracy? Well, it, that's a very interesting question. Neoliberalism was a movement that began in the 1980s in a, way, in a sense as a way to eliminate demagoguery mm -hmm. by instituting uh, a, a kind of um, cleaner version of capitalism. Corporations would run the world, but would do so without demagogues or authoritarian governments and the like. But um, it has been difficult, certainly in recent years, I think of course of the rise of, of Donald Trump and his movement in the United States uh, to completely eliminate demagogues. And we have seen the far right on the ascendancy so neoliberalism is under siege from both the right through the demagogues that run uh, Brazil, Turkey, 
uh, one might say Russia as well, and more recently with Trump in the United States. Uh, but it's also under siege from the left, which has argued that a corporate control of, of our societies is not good for the mass of people in society. Mm -hmm. So the world is in a great state of political disruption in part because we have battles going on uh, between neoliberals who are trying to hold the world together under corporate control, but under siege from uh, broadly speaking, the authoritarians who want to use more co coercive control politically, and from the left, from people who want to build a more democratic, uh, indeed socialist form of uh, social life. So it seems to me that there is just great political disruption right now. And neoliberalism, which had its heyday for a couple of decades, is no longer in, uh, in a, a clearly dominant position. Well, just the last uh, kind of remark from you. My question is, so what is the myth of the new normal? What is, what is the myth of the new normal? Well, it's interesting. Uh, and in fact, someone should, should write about the mythology. Now, let me say very briefly, when I refer to mythology, I don't mean falsehood. By myth, I mean a story that helps people to cope with their lives. So we live in mythology, whether we are fully conscious of it or, or not. So myths are not judged by whether they're true or false, but by whether they are living or dead. And today, to a degree, the new normal is a living myth. It is the belief that we need to make adjustments and conform to the restrictions of a global pandemic a ridden world and uh, eliminate our hopes for creating a better world in which we can provide communication to everyone, in which we could provide healthcare, education, in which we could fight climate change. Some are arguing that the new normal makes it very difficult for us to progress. And that in itself is a dangerous myth. So it seems to me we need to see through that myth and return to some of the fundamental social issues of education, of healthcare, uh, of poverty, that um, we are, are disrupting good parts of the world and that need uh, global policies uh, to fight. So yes, that is the myth of the new normal. Be very careful about it. And please, uh, I suggest you join me and others in resisting it. Thank you very much, Prof, for such a thought-provoking speech, uh, especially in the in the morning for us and quite late night for you over there. So um, I would like everybody to join me in giving a Prof uh, Mosko a round of applause, whatever you can do just to show. And I would give back the mic to the MC. So thank you very much. Thank you, my pleasure. Um, many thanks to Professor Emeritus Dr. Vincent Moscow for his keynote speech on the political economy of digital media in the new normal and Associate Professor Dr. Jamaluddin Assis for assisting the session. We would like to take a few photographs with Dr. Vincent Moscow and all participants as a token of remembrance. We would be glad if all participants could turn on your camera for a few moments. Please hold your smiles as the technical team gets ready to take a few screenshots of all panels. Please hold your smiles, everyone. We'll be taking Technical photographs. team, are you ready? Okay, we're gonna go through the first page. Big smiles, everybody. Great. All right, next one. Okay. All right. Yes, we hear you. I know we started quite early and some of us did not manage to grab a cup of coffee or tea to kickstart the day. Hence, we will going on a brief break after this. There's going to be a timer on the screen. We wish for your kind cooperation to hop back in time to ensure a smooth process for the entire day. See you in a few minutes. Bye. Thank you.